Good morning, you guys, and welcome to term four. Um, excuse my low energy this week. It sort of hit me that we will not be going back to school, at least to the physical facility of this year, and we will be continuing online learning. Not only that, but we are in our homes-ish until May 18th now. I'm a little bit bummed. I'm feeling a little bit low this week, and I'm sure you can relate. But of course, I'm here just to give you an overview of what to expect this week. So this is term four, week one. For elements of poetry, you guys are going to start reading act two of Hamlet, and I will post some things I want you to take a look at, and then some questions for you to answer. But before that, I wanted to talk a little bit about act one, because it's really interesting, and I wanna make sure everybody's understanding it, even though this version is easier to understand because it's a graphic novel, there are some things I would like to point out. Okay, so to begin the play in Hamlet, we have scene one, and we have a couple of guys, which is Marcellus and Bernardo. They are on watch, and Horatio enters the scene. Remember, he's the last one standing in the end, and he's kind of the voice of reason. He's skeptical, and so he approaches things not quite believing them at first, and he offers the audience a more rational voice outside of the situation. So you'll see that the men look to Horatio to kind of figure out what's going on with this apparition, which is a fancy word for ghost. And they talk about the reason why they're standing guard is because Fortinbras of Norway, the leader of the country Norway, is talking about invading Denmark and taking over because King Hamlet is now dead and they see things as unstable, even though Claudius is now king. So there is some instability politically in this situation. The ghost does come back and appears to try to speak or want to talk, but he leaves and the men try to have him come back to speak to him, but no such luck. The rooster crows and that sort of ends the whole situation and then day breaks. So in this first scene, you have established some of that weird vibe in the setting. It's very eerie. And when you introduce the ghost right away, you get an immediate sense of the haunting quality of the play. Also, things happen at night that don't necessarily happen during the day, which is very common for Shakespeare. So that's something that you're gonna to continue to see and remember the duality of things. Also, night versus daytime, dark versus light, uh, dead versus alive. And there's also nature in the background. Nature is doing different things that support what's going on in the plot, which is just good storytelling. So that's scene one. Okay, in scene two, we have quite a bit of dialogue. It's really important stuff that we need to know moving forward. So scene two, we have King Claudius making a speech. It's, you know, again, it's really political. Bring together Denmark. We really now need to unify. And to lighten the mood, he ends up talking about, or what he thinks is gonna lighten the mood. <laughs> not for Hamlet, of course. He talks about his marriage to Queen Gertrude. And Laertes, who is Polonius's son, he actually asked permission to go back to France, which was where he had come from. Not a big deal, just something to know that he's going to be gone for a while. Hamlet begins to tell King Claudius that he does not accept the marriage. He is beside himself. He wants to tell him how he's gonna kill himself. But then the two, Two guys, Bernardo and Horatio, come to talk to Hamlet about this apparition of this ghost, and Hamlet decides that he needs to go see it for himself. Okay, so we've, we're hitting a, a really important part in scene three because it establishes the relationships between Laertes and Ophelia, uh, a side relationship with Ophelia and Hamlet, and then also Polonius with his children, Ophelia and Laertes. So first, Laertes advises Ophelia not to speak to Hamlet anymore. He doesn't think that his intentions are good, that because he is a prince, he's got obligations that may mean that she's not part of the equation, so it would be wise for her not to fall for him or spend any more time with him. She seems to listen to that. She doesn't seem like a very strong character, which definitely goes on theme. There's this theme of in act one, very strong masculinity, there's a very strong male presence, but all of the female characters seem to be really kind of lame, for lack of a better uh, word. She tries to follow 
Laertes' advice to maintain her chastity and to stay away from Hamlet. Then Polonius appears, which is their father, who's their father, and he starts giving advice to Laertes, to, thy, be, uh, to thine own self be true, right? This is a very famous line. And Polonius gives Laertes a lot of advice, and he is never one to miss a chance for a speech. So he kind of goes on and on and on, even though he's also tearing, telling Laertes on the other side of his mouth that he needs to hurry up and catch his boat to France. Again, we have that duality thing, telling Laertes one thing, but then going on and on about something else that totally conflicts with what he just said. Since Polonius is meddlesome and he butts into other people's affairs, that ends up killing him because remember, he's the one standing behind the curtain spying on Hamlet speaking with his mother in the bedroom and Hamlet stabs the curtain seeing feet under it thinking that it's Claudius and all of a sudden he decides okay I'm gonna kill Claudius but of course it's Polonius and Polonius wouldn't be there if he wasn't eavesdropping so that is a character flaw that ends up killing him okay so scene four and five are all about the ghost and the ghost message to Hamlet so the ghost appears again to Horatio and Marcellus and then now to Prince Hamlet and it starts indicating somehow that this ghost wants to speak to young Hamlet. Horatio and Marcellus don't want him to follow, but Hamlet is convinced that he must and that it has to do with fate. And if you've read Shakespeare before, you know that fate and destiny is a huge consideration for Shakespeare. Are life events based on predetermined fate or destiny? Or is life just a random series of events based on decisions you make in the present? In this case, Hamlet believes it to be fate. So he follows the ghost, but the two other men decide to follow him just to make sure no harm is done to him. So good friends. In five, the ghost finally talks to Hamlet that he's kind of walking in a purgatory, meaning he's between heaven and hell. Basically like what we're doing in quarantine. So anyway, um, the ghost of King Hamlet tells Prince Hamlet, his son, that he was not killed by a viper, as everyone is saying, but that he was killed by Claudius, and he tells him the manner in which he was killed, which was poison being poured into his ear, which is very awful. Hamlet is outraged and plans to seek revenge on Claudius, which is what the ghost wants him to do. And so this begins the big question for Hamlet throughout the play. Do I seek revenge on my father's death or not? What do I do? Do I kill Claudius or not, basically? Thus, the act ends with Horatio and Marcellus promising Hamlet that they won't say a word, they will keep a secret, everything that happened that night, and they won't breathe any of it to another soul. <laughs> Last thing, my second question. What is your go-to snack during quarantine? Um, Mine is peanut butter, but I will admit that I'm beginning to crave Swedish fish. Um. <sighs> it is clearly time to end this, so I will see you all next week. Take care, stay healthy.